It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. I do want to, uh, on behalf of the official opposition, uh, send our uh, sincerest condolences to the Yurik family. It's uh, a very sad piece of news that was shared, and we we are all uh, uh, in. Uh, we all have we have their family in our our thoughts and prayers. Um, absolutely. Uh, speaker, my first question is to the premier. I hope he's going to take the opportunity to answer this question personally, because the buck is supposed to stop with him. When did the Premier learn that the cost of cancelling renewable energy contracts has soared to at least $231 million? The question is addressed to the Premier. Well, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. And our condolences also go out to the Eric family. Our, our prayers and thoughts are with them. I had an opportunity to speak to him last night and just passed on our, our condolences. You know, for you, Mr. Speaker, I am so proud during the election that we canceled the cap and trade carbon tax, the, the worst tax on the backs of the hardworking taxpayers. And I'm also proud that we saved the taxpayers $790 million. That's $790 million that would have went on the backs of companies, backs of the hardworking taxpayers. These wind turbines were rammed down the throats of communities that didn't even want them. And the reason, Mr. Speaker, that people are doing their laundry at 9 o'clock at night and 10 o'clock at night is because the opposition and the former Liberal government were gouging the people, absolutely gouging Response. the people of Ontario. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, last year, the Ford government repeatedly claimed that there would be no cost to cancelling these contracts. No cost. We know now that the cost has climbed to at least $231 million. And the Premier won't say when he found out. Uh, the government has budgeted $231 million for the cost of cancellation Order. this fiscal year. My question is, will there be further cancellation costs added next year? Premier. Well, Mr. M Mr. Speaker, again, the reason we have the highest hydro rates in North America is because of the NDP and the Liberals. They put put this plan together that has destroyed our energy file. And as I said out in the news conference, Mr. Speaker, we went out to raise some money down in New York, and one of the big banks came up to us and said, if, even if we try, not that they ever would, even if we try to destroy someone's energy file, a country's energy file, no one could have done a better job than the previous Liberal government and the current federal government. He said all the investment, billions and billions of dollars, have left the country. And the NDP condone this. They're for it. We saved the taxpayers $790 million as they stood by, as the hydro rates raised to be the highest in North America. Again, going on the backs, going on the backs of the hard-working people. There's, no, there's never been a more transfer of wealth from the ratepayers to the political insiders because of the NDP and the Liberals. Final supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think the Premier and the Conservatives live in a glass house because they started selling off and deregulating our electricity system when they were in office, Order. which is what exactly was the cause of the increase in our electricity rates in the history of this province. But today we're talking about this Premier's leadership. When the world was moving uh, towards the uh, 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 clean energy initiatives, uh, in the midst of a climate crisis, the Premier has taken $231 million away from our schools and away from our hospitals and handed them to the private companies Order. so that they can tear down wind farms and not supply green energy. And if that wasn't bad enough, the Ford government didn't even tell the people of Ontario that they were going to be hit with the bill. And today, the Question. Premier is shameless enough to say that he couldn't be more proud of this mess. So why is the Premier showing so little respect for the people of this province? Questions addressed to the Premier. Well, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, the only people that were disrespected were the people of this province under the NDP and Liberal government. They, they didn't worry about it. As, as, as I was saying in my previous answer, Mr. Speaker, there's never in the history of Ontario been more of a transfer of wealth from the hard-working ratepayers to the political insiders from the NDP and the Liberals upper in the history of Ontario. These people are making tens of millions of dollars off the backs of the ratepayers. Something is wrong. We saved the taxpayers $790 million on cancelling these terrible, terrible wind turbines. 
The next question. Leader of the Opposition. Questions also to the Premier. The people of Ontario simply can't believe this government when it comes to the cost of these cancelled contracts, Speaker. As the Premier knows, he has the power to request a special review by the auditor. Yesterday, the government refused to do so. Today, I hope the Premier will actually show some leadership. Will he do the right thing by the hardworking people of this province who've had $231 million sucked out of their pockets because of this government's decision, as far as we know, $231, $231 million? And will he actually ask the auditor to confirm the numbers, to conduct a complete review of the total cost of these cancelled contracts? Questions to the Premier. Again, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the reason there's there's 252,400 people working is because we looked at the energy fall. We made sure that we're looking at saving costs rather than increasing costs. Every single company, every single person that I went during the election and spoke to, number one concern was their energy costs. Right. You know, it came to the point of uh, heating or eating to a lot of people during the election. I remember one person came up to me in tears showing me their, their bill, that they couldn't afford it all because of the reckless, careless spending under the NDP and the Liberals. We saved this ta taxpayers of this province $790 million, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Well, I'm sure that person, Speaker, is still crying because their bill went up by about 2 per cent just last week. When the previous Liberal government refused to disclose the real costs, the real costs of cancelling the gas plants, the Premier himself at the time couldn't contain himself. He said, and I quote, there's zero accountability. This is what the Premier said at the time. He claimed the people of Ontario had been hoodwinked. He said, and I quote, I can't wait to bring responsible government to the folks of Ontario. Now, Speaker, how can this very same person, now that he sits in the Premier's chair, possibly, possibly justify refusing calling in the Auditor General to make sure the people of Ontario know how much their energy boondoggle is costing them? Members, please take their seats. Premier to reply. Through you, Mr. Speaker, for the first time in 15 years, the people of Ontario has, has seen accountability and transparency. They've seen us save them seven. They've seen us save six billion dollars for the taxpayers, making sure that we lower taxes, cut red tape, cut regulations. The economy, Mr. Speaker, is absolutely booming right now. We need more people to fill the jobs. We need a couple hundred thousand people to fill the jobs that are out there to keep, keep up with the production requirements. But again, the NDP supported their buddies over there, the Liberals, 90 per cent of the time. They, they, they were supporting the gas plants. They were supporting the big scam that was going on. Side by side, they were partners, and they're to be blamed for all the scandals and the disaster of our economy and losing 300,000 jobs. My friends, our economy is booming, absolutely booming. People around North America Spons? know it. We're an economic powerhouse in North America because of our government's policies. <laughs> Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, perhaps the Premier doesn't realize it, but when you get rid of independent officers of the legislature, you reduce transparency and you reduce accountability, which is exactly the first move that this government made when they took office. But look, that does not, um, that does not change the fact that governments all over the world are scrambling to embrace clean energy, and the Ford government is handing at least $231 million to companies Order. so that they can tear down renewable energy projects. That's enough money, Speaker, to completely repair every single school in Etobicoke North and in King Vaughan. When people are looking for transparent and honest government, the Ford government, just like the Liberal government with the glass, gas plants, is choosing to stonewall. They are choosing to stonewall, Speaker. People deserve so much better than this, and the Premier can fix it today by calling in the auditor. So my question to the Premier is, will he do that? 
Premier. Again, through you, Mr. Speaker, we saved $790 billion, million dollars, $790 million, $790 million to the hardworking taxpayers of this province. And if we had a chance, and it's unfortunate we weren't elected 10 years ago, we wouldn't be in the mess right now that we're in. We're in an absolute mess. We've been working hard to turn the corner. We're turning the corner, increasing health care spending, increasing education spending. The economy is booming. There's more jobs out there than how more than the people that we can fill them. So, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue looking at efficiencies. And if we had the chance to get rid of all the windmills, we would, wind turbines, I should say, because it's, it's totally unrealistic. We're paying 80 some odd cents a kilowatt versus seven or eight cents. Here, here. Something is broken here. Here, here. There's no one out there that agrees in paying 80 cents a kilowatt and Spons. making all the wind turbine uh, folks multi-multi-millionaires on the backs of the ratepayers. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of Education refused to own up to the fact that his actions are actively sabotaging teacher bargaining. The minister changed bargaining teams at the last minute, cancelled meetings, dropped poison pill positions on the table, expecting teachers to thank them for it. The minister doesn't have to call a press conference for us to know that this government has no intention of actually negotiating with teachers. Why won't the Premier admit that the only deal they're looking for is one that includes pink slips for teachers and overcrowded, underfunded classrooms for our kids? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to remind the member opposite that it was this government that got a voluntary agreement with QP just one month ago by negotiating in good faith, and that cannot be left out of the basis of the question. Let's not forget, Mr. Speaker, it's this government that has made reasonable offers at the table with OSSTF and so many others because we believe that education, the continuum of education should not be stopped, should not be impeded because negotiators cannot agree on an outcome. I want an outcome. That's why we've turned to mediation. It's why we've looked at this approach in the past, and it is our aim. It is the Premier's aim to get deals that keep kids in class and improve education for every child in this province. Thank you. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, parents are scrambling right now. They don't, they don't really care what the minister managed to pull off at the last minute during a federal election a month ago. The government has shown nothing nothing but contempt for the people who teach and support our children. Their refusal to reverse education cuts and their absolutely chaotic approach to bargaining have left negotiations going nowhere. But despite the government's actions, teachers, teachers remain willing to bargain, and there is still time to reach a deal that protects and strengthens our education system. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, will he stop this reckless game he's playing, reverse these heartless cuts, and get back to the bargaining table, or does the Premier just think that students aren't worth it? Questions been referred to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the parents of this province, from Dundas to Davenport and everyone in, everywhere in between, actually do care that this government got a good deal for parents that kept kids in class. They do care. They do care, Mr. Speaker, that we're investing more in this budget than ever before. They care that we're supporting positive mental health in the class. They support our improvements to the math curriculum, to go back to basics. They support our initiatives to ensure STEM is at the front of class. Mr. Speaker, everything we do is about ensuring Order. our students are able to achieve their potential, graduate and get access to good paying jobs. We will not be deterred from our mission. The next question, the member for Burlington. Speaker, my question is to the Premier, and I'd like to wish him a happy belated birthday to start off. Premier, I know that our government, and you in particular, have made the issue of national unity and bridging diverging regional interests across this country as one of our key priorities. We have seen a growing concern on this country about regional economics, divisions, and sense of national disunity. This concern was even captured in a recent Globe and Mail and Veronics Institute poll, which indicated the growing concerns of disunity in this country. When asked about the satisfaction and the direction of this country two years ago, there was an 11-point difference between the regions. That gap now stands today at 28 points. Premier, can you elaborate more on the historic announcement you made this morning about what steps our government is taking to bring this country together? Great question. 
question to the Premier. I want to thank my champion, MPP from, from Burlington. The people, the people absolutely love her out there when I'm there, so thank you. I want to, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to congratulate the federal uh, minister's uh, appointments yesterday. And uh, we really look forward to working with them and rolling up our sleeves and getting our ministers involved and having a real collaborative uh, relationship with them and, and building infrastructure, making sure that we, we focus on, on things that matter, uh, the infrastructure, the transit, uh, broadband across this country. As we've always said, what is good for Ontario, Mr. Speaker, is good for Canada. And what is good for Canada is good for Ontario. And I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to having the premiers here in Toronto for the first time in, in recent memory. I can't even remember all the premiers gathering here, and it's, uh, it's going to be great. But we have to respect uh, the concerns of the people from the West. We also have to respect the people from, from the East. And I always believe there's always common ground when we come together because we all get along quite well. Here, here. Good question. Premier, that is truly historic news and speaks to the important role that Ontario plays in the Federation. As we all know, Ontario and specifically past Ontario Premiers have played a major role in supporting national unity and discussions with the federal government. This includes the strong leadership of Premier Robarts, spearheading the Confederation of Tomorrow Conference, Bill Davis and the 1982 constitutional discussions, David Peterson and Bob Ray with the Meech Lake, and Charlottetown Accords, and Mike Harris following the 1995 Quebec referendum. Premier, can you speak to the Legislature on what priorities this new Council on Provincial-Federal Relations will have regarding Ontario-specific interests? Premier. I want to thank our, our member. And as, as we announced, the, the key areas that we believe that where we can work together, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've been in dialogue with the Prime Minister's office and we've come up with common ground. There's so many areas that we can support the people of Ontario and, and also support the, the people of Canada. Uh, one of the areas is a subway expansion plan. It's an amazing plan. I, I want to thank the federal government for their contribution so far, but we're going to need more support there from the, the federal government to make sure that they hit the threshold of, of 40%, uh, percent, Mr. Speaker, through the Canada Infrastructure uh, Program. We need, we need shovels in the ground. Uh, let's put politics aside. Let's start getting things done for the people of Ontario. Again, as I said earlier, uh, another area that we have to focus on is, is health care. Uh, no province can go alone on, on health care. We have a great minister that's going to end hallway health care. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question today is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Uh, the people of Hamilton learned last night the disturbing news that 24 billion litres of untreated sewage has been seeping undetected over the past four and a half years into Shadoke Creek and Coots Paradise. Can the Premier please tell the House when exactly was the Ministry aware that raw sewage was leaking into the water in Hamilton? Wow. Questions to the Premier. Minister of Energy. Referred to the Minister of Energy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My thoughts go out to my colleague Jeff York today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it is the ministry's role to ensure that the city of Hamilton is taking all necessary steps to clean up uh, the sewage spill to the natural environment, repair, fix the combined sewage outflow tank equipment and prevent future discharges. The city uh, reported the discharge to the ministry's Spill Action Centre on July 18, 2018. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the city was ordered to, among other things, quantify the amount of sewage uh, and what was in the sewage, discharge to the creek, evaluate the impacts to the creek, assess the need for remediation and or mitigation, and to provide the most effective method, uh, including timelines. Submit that spill uh, report with the cleanup efforts uh, to date uh, and identify all um, uh, combined sewer overflow locations, Mr. Speaker, and that work continues. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. So, uh, since the Premier hasn't answered, and what we've heard, we hear now is that the Ministry has known for over a year and a half that 10,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools of sewage has been seeping into Hamilton's fresh water supply, and yet it's beyond disturbing 
that the ministry knew this for over a year. They knew that this was happening, but they refused to make this public. And they also refused to step in and help the city with this emergency cleanup. So why did the ministry not immediately notify Hamilton residents that a spill had taken place and immediately assist with the emergency cleanup? Minister of Energy, members, please take their seats. Mr. Speaker, to continue, uh, while the city submitted information to the ministry as required by the order, uh, we issued a second order on November 14, 2019, requiring uh, clarification uh, and confirmation of impacts, recommendations for remediation, mitigation, uh, and monitoring. Uh, the matter has been forwarded to the ministry's investigation and enforcement branch. It would be inappropriate to make any additional uh, con uh, comments, except that the ministry will continue to work with the Hamilton Public Health Unit, the City of Hamilton, the Hamilton Conservation Authority, and other agencies in order to ensure that the appropriate corrective actions uh, are being taken to mitigate the impacts of this sewage discharge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question: The member for Simcoe Gray. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to uh, the Minister of Health. Uh, Minister, my constituents, uh, Jamie LaRock and Sasha Hoyan, have two young sons, aged seven and nine, who have cystic fibrosis which, as you know, leads to the destruction of the lungs and early death. Or CAMBI can help prevent that destruction, yet the Ministry of Health has attached a stringent prescribing criteria to this medication. The Ministry claims Ontario is providing coverage for CAMBI for pediatric cystic fibrosis patients on an exceptional case-by-case -case basis, yet not a single patient in Ontario has qualified for access. My constituents are having to watch their sons struggle with this disease. One son is on a drug trial, while the other son is not. Speaker, will the minister adjust the prescribing criteria for these life-saving drugs to allow doctors and not bureaucrats to allow access to these drugs? Thank you. Minister of Health. Thank you. thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for your question. I know this is a very serious issue for many families across Ontario, including some of your guests who are here today, who I would also like to welcome to Queen's Park. I look forward to meeting with uh, several passionate advocates for cystic fibrosis next week. Uh, this is an issue that we have been studying. The issue of Orcambi, I know, is only available under limited circumstances at present, but it is the requirement that any new products that are being introduced in Ontario have to go through the same trials. They have to go through the same process. It wouldn't be appropriate for any Minister of Health anywhere to jump in and make decisions. I'm not a physician. I need to leave that up to physicians to make that determination as well. But I can tell you that this is a matter of priority in the government. I am working with the uh, Assistant Deputy Minister who is dealing with Response. approval of, of medications, and we hope to have a, a, a solution produced very soon because, again, I know this is a very important issue for many Ontarians. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, back to the uh, minister, and I thank the minister for that answer. As you know, uh, Minister, when we were in opposition uh, some five years ago, we went through this very same process for the drug Kaleidical for, for Maddie Vanstone, and Maddie's uh, here today. And I think uh, what we've learned since then is that the fundamental root of this problem, the approval of cystic fibrosis drugs across the board, there's many other drugs, um, we've never really got to the root of the problem, which was we need a special drugs uh, uh, program in this in this province, and I know the minister is well aware of that. Vertex is the company that makes uh, most of these cystic fibrosis drugs, and I know you've met with the company and you're meeting with them again. But it is hard for my constituents and for cystic fibrosis sufferers across Ontario to, under to try and understand that 18 other countries in the Western industrialized world uh, cover these drugs under their drug plans, and Canada is one of the only uh, Westernized countries that does not. So I would encourage the minister to keep this as a question and work as quickly as possible to help put Canada on the map, make Ontario a leader, and provide these life-saving drugs to cystic fibrosis patients. Thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you. Well, I certainly recall the situation a number of years ago and uh, with the use of uh, Kaleidico, and it's wonderful to see Maddie here today looking so well. We want all young people to have the opportunity to live happy, healthy childhoods, youth, uh, adult 
childhood. And so it is important that government concentrate resources and make sure that we bring forward medications that are going to allow them to live those happy lives. With respect to our Cambi, we have been in conversations with Vertex. We are working with, as I said, the Assistant Deputy Minister. My office is also involved because I know that this has been a long procedure, especially considering that other jurisdictions have already approved or can be we hope to come to a satisfactory resolution very soon to make our can be more immediately available. I know there are several other medications that are being considered, Simdeco and Trikafta. Uh, one is the former is with Health Canada right now. The other one has not come before Health Canada yet. It has to go through that process first, but we will deal with it very quickly as soon as it comes to the provincial level. So thank you again for, for the question and thank you to your guests for being here today. Thank you. The next question, the member for Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is also for the Minister of Health. Speaker, our government is working tirelessly to address the concerns that Ontarians have about our public health care system. The previous Liberal government neglected Ontario's health care system, leaving it on life support. I'm sure we can all agree that it's time to bring more accountability and transparency back to the system. Speaker, as part of the fall economic statement, the Minister of Health, Health brought forward proposed changes that would promote accountability in our OHIP program and one of the largest expenditures of government. These proposed measures will help to prevent incorrect billing for a publicly funded health care service. Our government is committed to ensuring that Ontarians get the best value for their tax dollars. Will the minister please tell the House why these changes are being implemented? Minister of Health. The member from Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill, for your question. Speaker, our government is introducing changes that, if passed, will make account OHIP more accountable and transparent. OHIP is a $16 billion program, representing more than 25 per cent of all health care spending, and that's approximately 10 per cent of the entire government spending. These changes were brought forward directly with respect to recommendations that have been made for several years by the Auditor General. For several years, the Auditor General found long-standing weaknesses in the laws, policies and processes that oversee physician billings. Recognizing that incorrect billing is often done inadvertently rather than by directly doing so, we are also committed to improving education to help providers understand how to bill and how to correct billings. Speaker, similar to the process to review Canadian taxes, it is important that the government meet its responsibility to ensure that taxpayer Response. dollars are being accounted for and then should there be a need to be able to recoup those funds that are not met. Speaker, we are taking our responsibility as financial stewards for Ontario taxpayers very seriously. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for taking the, the steps to address this long-standing issue. These changes are fair and reasonable and will ensure Ontario taxpayers have the confidence they need and deserve in their public health care system. Our proposed changes would strengthen OHIP accountability measures and will ensure a sustainable health insurance plan today and into the future. The principles of accounting, transparency and value for money are what these changes are built on. I know that it's important to my constituents that our government remain transparent and that we ensure taxpayer dollars are spent wisely. Would the minister please tell the House about the steps we've taken that have led to these changes? Minister of Health. Yes, thank you. Our government remains committed to working with our stakeholders, including the Ontario Medical Association, to build the policies and process that underpin this legislation. In fact, these changes follow many months of consultations with the Ontario Medical Association. We have ensured that their input be included in many of our changes, such as limiting the recovery period to two years, the new audit process occurring on an ongoing basis only, establishing a target to complete audits within 12 months, and, Speaker, the list does go on. Our government values doctors' immeasurable contribution to the health and well-being of Ontarians. However, I am sure that we will all agree that no doctor should be able to bill OHIP inappropriately. Ontario taxpayers deserve Response. increased accountability, including a fair audit process, so that public money is spent in the most comprehensive manner and cost-effective manner. 
That is what we will. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Members' Integrity Act states that all cabinet ministers must put their business assets in an arm's length trust. This morning's Global Mail reports that U.S. corporate filings made in July by Deco Labels, the company the Premier owned and operated for many years, indicated that Doug Ford was still president of the company. Since Deco Labels should be in an arm's length trust, how is it that the Premier is still being listed as the president on legal documents? The question is addressed to the Premier. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the company is in, in blind trust. It went through the Integrity Commissioner, and uh, he, he approved it. But I have nothing to do with uh, the company and day-to-day -day operations. But I, I appreciate uh, the, the question there. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The provisions in the Act are designed to ensure that there is not an appearance of a conflict of interest. It's sure. important for any cabinet minister to be completely arm's length from business interests. According to filings with the Canadian government, DECO's five directors are family relations to the Premier. Each director lists the Premier's family home as their business address. In fact, the Premier's personal home is listed as the mailing address for DECO. In comments to CBC News this summer, Premier's office staff claim to have knowledge about DECO's current client list. And now we see that in the U.S., the company still seems to think the Premier is running the company. The Premier just stated he has nothing to do with the day-to-day -day activities of DECO labels. But can the Premier say in the legislature today that he is absolutely at arm's length and has no dealings with the company at any level? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Question addressed to the Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, the company's in, in blind trust. Uh, I'm too busy turning this province around from the mess that they left. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Training, Culture and Sp uh, Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, our government is supporting the 2021 Canada Games in the Niagara region by committing to a cost-shared investment of $29 million for the construction of new and upgraded sports facilities for the 18 sport teams from every province and territory that will be coming to Niagara. Speaker, the Games will feature an estimated 5,000 participants and 4,000 volunteers, in addition to the tens of thousands of visitors from across the province and across the country from home and abroad who will be cheering on their favourite athletes. With this in mind, could the minister please explain to the members of the Legislature how this provincial funding will help drive economic activity not only in Niagara but across the province? Yeah. Minister of Her Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Cultural Industries. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I want to say thank you to the member from Niagara West Glenbrook for his strong advocacy on sport across the province, as well as the two members uh, from the New Democrats, Niagara Falls, as well as St. Catharines, who joined us on a lovely afternoon in Niagara as we announced our government's support for this important initiative. You know, we spend $25 million investing in sport across the province of Ontario, and it yields a $12.6 billion economic imprint. In this particular case, the government of Ontario is representing $10.3 million in investment for capital and operating costs, and an additional $29 million invest investing in infrastructure and facilities. In Red Deer this year, there's a $132 million economic imprint, but in Niagara in 2021, this number will astound you, we will create over $400 million in economic activity, contributing to 2,100 jobs across the province. Response? Mr. Speaker, this is a great return on investment, and it's a great return on sports. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your response. It's clear these games will have a significant economic impact in the Niagara region and across Ontario. In fact, the 2021 games, as was mentioned, will spur an estimated $400 million in economic activity, with an anticipated 2,100 jobs to be created. The games, however, are more than an investment in our local economy, but also provide opportunities for local athletes to compete on a national stage. And this, of course, could not happen without the dedication and knowledge of our athletes' coaches. Could the minister please highlight the way our government is supporting our coaches and the development of our teams across Ontario? Sure. Minister thank of Heritage. You, thank you, Speaker. That's an excellent question because not only do we top the charts with Sean Mendes through this ministry and supporting our, our uh, artists, but we also top podiums around the world. Speaker, did you know, for example, that through our provincial sport organizations that this ministry funds, that we supported on uh, Bianca Andrescu, through our, our Canadian Sport Institute, we 
We've invested $8.2 million, and they are training Andre de Grasse as well as Penny Alexiak. We are topping the podiums worldwide, and I have no reason to doubt that in Niagara 2021, our athletes are going to be the top performers, but they will also be the safest, because for the first time in Canadian history, every single athlete in Canada will have to adhere to Canada's first and only concussion legislation, Rowan's Law, and that will be happening in Niagara 2021. <laughs> Speaker, this province isn't open for business, only open for business or open for jobs. We're also open for athletes. The next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. This year, my constituent, Sonia De Laurentiis, was diagnosed with a form of metastatic lung cancer that had traveled to her brain, liver, and vertebrae. She is with us in the members' gallery today with her sons, Davide and Roberto. Sonia receives treatment at one of the best cancer hospitals in the world, Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Her oncologist recommended a specific medication that was her absolute best chance to fight her cancer. But this medication costs her family $10,000 a month because it is a take-home cancer drug. This is an immense burden on her family. Minister, will you commit today to help this family and cover the cost of Sonia's take-home cancer drugs? The Minister of Health. Thank you. I thank the member very much for the question, and I'm very sorry for your constituent situation, and I thank her for being here today. Uh, this is a situation that we are reviewing medications. We are reviewing the uh, items that can be on our Ontario Drug Benefit Plan that can be available to people. We do have the, uh, the Trillium program that is available for people that find it difficult to pay for their medications, but I would certainly be happy to, um, to meet with your constituent to understand more particulars and see what we may be able to do to assist her. Supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for agreeing to meet with her, but she's tried everything. If Sonia and her family lived in any province west of Ontario, she wouldn't need to ask for help because take-home cancer drugs are publicly funded there. In fact, most cancer treatments are now available as take-home medication to meet the needs of patients, improve their quality of life, and to reduce hospital trips. Just last year, this government voted against an NDP motion to cover take-home cancer drugs. That was wrong. It's time for Ontario to catch up to the rest of our country. Will the Minister of Health do the right thing, finally cover take-home cancer drugs under OHIP so people like Sonia get the help they deserve? I ask the members to take their seats. Minister of Health to reply. Well, I, I understand there is an issue with respect to take-home cancer drugs, and I know this is a not of comfort to, to your constituent today, but that's one of the reasons why we are doing our transformation of our health care system to bring it into the 21st century. And I mean that in respect of everything that we're doing in health, our policies, our processes, our technology, everything. So I, I can't make a promise on the spot with respect to this particular issue, but I can tell you that we are reforming our system so it will be more responsive to the needs of Ontarians in the future. And again, I reiterate my willingness to, to meet with Sonia and her family to discuss how we might specifically be of some assistance to her um, as she's dealing with her health problems today. Thank you. Next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the very lovely Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Our government heard loud and clear from consumers and real estate professionals alike to review the age legislation to reflect the modern marketplace. That is why we've introduced the Trust in Real Estate Services Bill. Yesterday, the minister highlighted five key messages in the Act, one of the messages being enhancing consumer choice and confidence. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please explain how the Trust in Real Estate Services Act would enable regulatory changes, giving consumers more choice in the real estate sector? The Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I very much appreciate the question from the member from Cambridge. She's doing a great job for her riding, and clearly, 
clearly she's demonstrating that she is as committed to getting consumer protection right in Ontario as we all are in our caucus, because we're introducing more re modern regulatory systems, systems that will reflect today's real estate sector. It has changed so much in the last 20 years. Our government is giving consumers more choice in the purchase and sale process by permitting real estate professionals and brokerages to disclose details of competing offers at the seller's discretion. Currently, in multiple offer situations, brokerages are required to disclose the number of competing offers to every person who has made an offer. But the regulation does Spons. not allow the brokerages to disclose the substance of the competing offers. So, if the bill passes, Speaker, poten potential sellers excuse me, could choose whether to participate in this more open process by providing… Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her kind words and for her answer, and also for working so hard with consumers and real estate professionals across our province to enhance consumer confidence and reduce burden in the real estate industry. Our government is committed to continue consulting with consumers and stakeholders to develop proposed regulations that will help consumers make more informed decisions. Minister, you have also spoken in this House about some of the key elements of the Trust in Real Estate Services Act. For example, ensuring an efficient and effective regulation in the real estate industry. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government will ensure efficient regulation in the real estate industry through the Trust in Real Estate Services Act? Minister to reply. Absolutely. Mr. Speaker, our government intends to improve the regulation of the real estate sector by updating the powers available to the Real Estate Council of Ontario known, and its registrar. It's known as RICO, and we're allowing RICO's registrar to consider a broader range of factors when considering eligibility for registration. We are giving RICO the authority to levy administrative penalties. We are providing RICO's discipline committee the authority to revoke or suspend a real estate professional's registration. Consumers have been asking for this. We've listened and we're acting. Speaker, these are just some of the changes of our proposed legislation, and these updates will not only enhance consumer protection, but improve the information consumers receive about what real estate professional and brokerages must do for them. Here, here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In 2018, your government eliminated rent control for new units. Yesterday, I heard from a group of tenants at 22 John Street in York Southwestern who all live in units that are no longer protected by rent control. As their leases have come up, some of these tenants are facing rent increases as high as 25 per cent. Speaker, that's $375 a month in increase, almost $4,500 a year. I don't know about you, but most people I know simply cannot afford a rent increase that high. How can this Premier justify such steep rent increases and all in the name of rolling out the red carpet for his developer friends? Questions to the Deputy Premier? To the Minister of Municipal Affairs. And Referred to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker. And I want to thank the, uh, the Honourable Member for that uh, question. Uh, our government believes that every Ontarian needs a safe place to call home, and that's why we're committed uh, to uh, listening to uh, both sides of the equation and try to make uh, the system fairer for both tenants uh, and landlords. And we want to uh, encourage uh, a, a, a continued dialogue. Uh, that's why, as part of our housing supply action plan, we consulted uh, with both tenant and landlords, and we are reviewing uh, what we heard. Uh, as we move forward with the system. And I know that I've kept uh, my colleague, the Attorney General, uh, informed as we've moved uh, through the consultations because I know that he and I have a shared uh, responsibility when it comes to the Residential Tenancies Act and the Landlord Tenant Board. So uh, we're going to continue Response. to analyze what we've heard. We're going to move forward with uh, some legislative and, and regulatory changes. And I encourage the member to have her constituents continue to have the dialogue with Thank you. Thank you very much. Supplementary, the member for York Southwestern. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question again is to the uh, Premier. This government's decision to slash rent control for new units means that residents in my riding of York Southwestern are seeing rent increases as high as 25%. This is shameful, Mr. Speaker. People cannot afford these kinds of increases. 
In an email reply to one of the tenants, the Premier's office said that exempting new units from rent control will, and I quote, encourage both big developers and small landlords to create more affordable apartments. Mr. Speaker, hundreds of dollars a month worth of rental increases in the opposite of affordable. Will the Premier rise in this House today and commit to reversing the cuts to rent control? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, again, Speaker, just to, to correct uh, the member's record, uh, our government was elected on a promise to not just increase housing supply, but we kept our promise uh, to preserve rent control for existing tenants. However, to stimulate uh, construction of new rental housing, our government uh, announced an exemption on new, new units from rent control, and actually, you know, our reach has sh uh, research has shown uh, the complete opposite. Uh, since our announcement last November, we've been seeing some very promising signs of increased development, and our examples include over uh, the first 10 months of 2019, there has been 3,838 rental starts in the Toronto area. Speaker, that is the most for any period in any year since 1992. Developers ha have nearly 53,000 new units of rental housing planned for the Toronto area Spons. in the third quarter of 2019. Our research has also shown that the rent control exemption for new, new, new units has seen significant impacts in the province of Manitoba. Our research shows the complete opposite, Speaker. Excellent. Next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you so much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Burlington's Joseph Grand Hospital has served our community since 1961. Over the past year, I've met with patients, administrators, and health care workers, and every one of them recognized that our health care system needs significant change, that it needs to become more patient-centered. The Minister of Health earlier this year visited Joseph Grand Hospital to learn more about how their integrated care model has improved patient outcomes in Burlington, especially for seniors. Yesterday's announcement on the free dental program, low-income seniors, will make a huge difference for people in my riding, like Anne and Judith, who've been asking for this kind of support for years. Can the minister tell this House about our strategy and how this new seniors' dental program fits into ending hallway health care? And thank you to the member from Burlington for her question. Our government is taking action to end hallway health care through a comprehensive four-pillar strategy and is already making a difference. A main part of our strategy is prevention and health promotion. A lack of preventative dental care can lead to serious health problems down the road. This can require hospitalization or intensive treatment in order to fix. Unfortunately, not every Ontarian has enjoyed access to preventative dental care. Yesterday, the Premier, the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility and I announced our government is keeping our promise to provide publicly funded dental care to low-income senior Ontarians. While helping low-income seniors with preventative dental care, our new Seniors Dental Program will help keep people out of hospital emergency rooms. Response. Because this is just one part of our comprehensive plan to end hallway health care, and I look forward to discussing more about the other pillars of plan and my supplementary answer. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Health who were involved in making yesterday's announcement possible. Health promotion initiatives like the Free Seniors Dental Program are a great way to improve the quality of life for our senior speaker. We know that there's a relationship between oral health and overall wellness. The Academy of General Dentistry found that over 90 per cent of all systemic diseases produce oral signs and symptoms. That's why this free dental pro health program for low-income seniors will improve overall health while helping to reduce pressures on hospital emergency rooms. Our four-pillar plan to end hallway health care is just getting started, Mr. Speaker, and it will lead to better outcomes for all Ontarians. Can the minister tell this House more about the work our government is doing to end hallway health care? Mr. Bell. Well, thank you. Preventative care and health promotion is the first pillar on our plan to end hallway health care. As a second piece, we are placing a focus on ensuring that patients receive 
the most appropriate care possible, which is why we've introduced new models of care for 911 patients. We will help keep patients out of hospital when a more appropriate health care provider can be found. Next, through Ontario Health and the upcoming implementation of Ontario Health Teams, we will better integrate care to improve patient flows. We are working to help Ontarians who no longer need to be in hospital to return to their homes with the extra supports that they need. Finally, Speaker, we are investing $27 billion over the next 10 years in hospital infrastructure projects to increase our capacity, including new and upgraded hospitals and community Response. care facilities. Mr. Speaker, this is the most comprehensive connected plan in the history of our province, and we are going to continue towards working at our goal of ending hallway. Thank you very much. The next question, the member from Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. For months, the tens of thousands of Niagara drivers who rely on the Thorold Tunnel daily have experienced inconveniences, delays, and frustration. With the recent news that the MTO is closing two-way traffic through the tunnel, many of our constituents and local elected officials have come forward to express deep concerns. The Ministry of Transportation has failed to address the difficulties this will pose for access to major hospitals, stroke clinics, and ambulance transportation, potentially putting residents at risk. One-way traffic through the Thorold Tunnel for the foreseeable future is not a solution. It creates a myriad of other issues and will result in major disruptions. Is the minister prepared to listen to local elected officials and take the necessary steps to maintain the current traffic configuration in order to ensure our community is safe, accessible, and moving efficiently? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member opposite for the question. I received a letter earlier this week from the member opposite, as well as other members of the opposition's caucus from Niagara on this issue. I've also had a chance to have a conversation within our caucus with our member from Niagara West, uh, who had uh, spoken about his recommendation that, uh, that the ministry consult with municipal stakeholders as we continue to find a solution uh, for drivers in Niagara. Mr. Speaker, I recognize and I appreciate uh, the difficulties that, uh, that the closures uh, at the Thorough Tunnel are having for motorists in, uh, in the area. And keeping drivers informed of potential closures is very important, and ministry officials do communicate regularly about construction work through traffic bulletins, through transportation authorities, our 511 service, and through media channels. But we are always striving to do better, and we will continue Response. to find ways to improve our communication channels with municipalities and with drivers. Since learning of this issue last week, Mr. Speaker, I've directed senior officials in my office and the ministry to develop new uh, solutions and to report back Thank to me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is also to the Minister of Transportation. Over 24,000 vehicles pass through the Thorold Tunnel each day. Most of them are either residents of Niagara Falls or traveling to work in Niagara Falls. We have local business owners telling us this is a disaster for their businesses. Residents tell us about the hardship this will cause them. And there are concerns over response time from first responders. How is it possible that this lane reduction and closure was planned without accounting for snow plows being able to fit through the tunnel? That makes absolutely no sense. Local elected officials are demanding a meeting to get answers about what the minister, when the minister became aware the tunnel was unsafe. Will the minister Question. immediately sit down with local elected officials to answer these questions? and commit, and this is important, commit extra resources to get this tunnel open quickly to both east and westbound lanes. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question and for raising the concerns of uh, residents and motorists of Niagara Region. I want to reiterate, Mr. Speaker, for the members of the House that we have heard the concerns that have been raised, and the ministry is looking for the best and a better path forward to address these concerns. With respect to concerns regarding snow clearance, a traditional snowplow does not fit in the current state of the Thorold Tunnel. That means that if it snows more than two and a half centimeters, we will sh need to shut the tunnel to clear the snow. We know that this is not an ideal solution, and we are looking 
for better ways forward so that we can provide real long-term solutions for motorists in the Niagara region. The ministry is currently finalizing a long-term plan and will share the plan with the public shortly. Thank you. The next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Energy. Uh, natural gas is Ontario's most common heating source and has been proven to be much more affordable than other uh, sources uh, such as electricity, oil or propane. Yet much of Ontario still does not have access to natural gas. In, in Durham region, uh, rural, uh, rural parts of the region don't have access, like parts of Scugog. Uh, and I know we're really looking forward to progress on this file. Could the minister update us what we're doing uh, to expand access to natural gas to parts of Ontario that don't yet have it? Associate Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member, uh, honourable member from Durham, for her question, her great representation, and service to the people of Durham. The Natural Gas Expansion Support Program was created under the Access to Natural Gas Act to help extend access to natural gas to Ontarians across the province. The program encouraged communities to partner with gas distributors on new projects and submit them to the Ontario Energy Board. Mr. Speaker, the success of this program has been incredible. I'm proud to have announced that projects in Chatham-Kent, Southern Bruce, and the Chippewas of Tam's First Nation are all underway, with several more coming soon. We will continue to encourage partnerships between communities and distributors to extend natural gas to as many interns as possible, which will make our province more attractive for business and lower costs for all. Yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the Minister for just highlighting the importance of that partnership uh, between communities and distributors. I know uh, one of the great things about our program is that more communities are going to be eligible than under the previous program. And I know uh, Ian and Lynn in Scugog are really looking forward to shovels hitting the ground and, and expansion on Scugog Island. Um, could the Minister please update us on just how much Ontarians can expect to save once they're connected to natural gas. The Associate Minister of Energy. Thank you, Speaker. And again, what a great question from the member from Durham. The benefits of, of expanding natural gas to communities in Ontario cannot be overstated. Switching to natural gas can save the average residential customer $2,200 per year on their energy bill. These are significant savings for families and businesses across our great province. Furthermore, natural gas expansion also signals that our province is open for business. For example, in Chatham-Kent, in the riding of our incredible member from Lambton-Kent, Middlesex, the additional natural gas capacity in that community could bring back approximately 1,400 jobs in the greenhouse industry alone. Right. We're going to keep expanding natural gas across our province to realize savings for residents, heating their homes, and to create a stronger business climate in our province. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Comiskaming Cochrane. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. Highway 11 is the Trans-Canada Highway, and below North Bay, it's a first-class highway, specifically with winter maintenance. It's treated first-class. When you cross over North Bay, it's a second-class highway. Snow removal is second-class. This isn't just the NDP who's been complaining about this. All our residents across Northern Ontario, I'd like to quote the member of Nipissing in the last parliament that his, constitu his constituents and municipalities want the Ministry of Transportation to undertake the evaluation and potential reclassification of all provincial highways to ensure adequate road maintenance. Yet when we put forward to consider making Highway 1117 Class 1 for winter maintenance, it was roundly, solidly defeated by your, even the consideration was solidly defeated. Do you believe that drivers on Highway Question. 11 or Highway 17 or Highway 11 North deserve Class 2 winter maintenance and that their lives continue to be put at risk? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Transportation. Preferred the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I um, appreciate the, the question and the opportunity to respond. Um, Winter months pose significant problems across our province for highway maintenance and highway clearance, and no more, no more so than in, 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 nor in, the nor in northern Ontario. Highways are classified along five classes, and these are technical designations. Highways 11 and Highway 17 are classified technically as Class II highways. 
However, practically, the level of service and highway maintenance that the Ministry of Transportation, through private contractors and through their work, have been able to provide is at, at a better standard than Class 1 highways oh, in, the, okay. in southern Ontario and in northern Ontario. For Class 1 highways, Mr. Speaker, the standard to get to bare pavement is eight hours. On Highways 11 and Highway 7, Response. the standard, the on average, has been seven hours. So, Mr. Speaker, we are focused on making sure that we provide the level of safety and maintenance required across our highway system, and especially. Thank you very much. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you to the minister. And I'm 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 glad you're studying this file because I brought up an issue uh, when the Liberals were in power, and I'm going to quote it again. The last time we had access to this information, if your car is registered in the district of Temiskaming and it is involved in an accident on a provincial highway, it is four times as likely to be fatal. The Liberals solved that problem by stopping to publish the information. So if it's true that, that, uh, that maintenance is better in Temiskaming than it is in Southern Ontario, Show us that information because people continue to die on our highways. Members, please take your seats. I recognize the Minister of Transportation to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. The safety of our highways is the number one priority of the Ministry of Transportation. And that's why I am very pleased to report to this House that we are continuing to find ways to improve on the already very good record that we have in the province. We are, we are leading in North America on safety in our highways, but our winter conditions in the north provide very difficult circumstances for our motorists, and we are continuing, continuing to work. It is a nonpartisan issue, Mr. Speaker. We are looking to provide real solutions to improve. The ministry is looking to find find new ways to improve, to deal with get conditions that, that are continuing to worsen, to worsen, Mr. Speaker. But seven hours to bare pavement is better than the standard that we expect on our Class 1 highways. And the Ministry Bonds. of Transportation is very pleased to be able to provide that level of service, but will continue to find ways to improve. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. Member for York Southwestern has a point of order. Point of order, yes, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, when answering, uh, the Minister of Co Municipal Affairs and Housing have stated that he is trying to uh, correct my records. As you know, the, the standing orders states that another member cannot correct another member's record. So I want to state that that was I uh, stand my question, and the Minister hasn't answered my question. It is uh, within the standing orders to allow a member to correct their own record, but there's no provision in the standing orders for another member to correct another member's record. The member for Niagara West has a point of order. Joined uh, us, I'd like to uh, welcome all the members of my riding association. Here. No, no, no. We're not entertaining points of order to introduce guests outside of the regular time that's set aside by the standing orders to introduce guests. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Toronto Centre has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing concerning cuts to rent control. This matter will be debated Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas, has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines concerning raw sewage spill into Coots Paradise in Hamilton. This matter will be debated Tuesday at 6 p.m. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.